Good morning, everyone. My name is Nigel Henley, tra Training and Communication Specialist for the Division of Health and Wellness School Nutrition Programs team. I want to thank you for joining us on today's open call to support you as you prepare to serve meals for the upcoming school year. I'd first like to thank those of you who completed the open call content interest survey. This survey is instrumental in helping us determine what topics are of most interest to you to discuss on these calls moving forward. As a reminder, that survey is currently open and will remain open until this biweekly series of calls is over. You may complete the survey as many times as you'd like, and I encourage each of you to continue to submit responses to the survey as your interests change. As I can imagine, many of you on the line today have quite a few questions. We will address your questions in three ways. First, as you think of questions pertaining to today's topic, feel free to send them to the team using the chat feature. My teammate Kimberly Thompson is going to send a link to the survey in the chat feature in just a second. Look for the orange bubble at the bottom of the screen to find that chat feature. And while you're there, go ahead and send us a quick hello so that we know you found it. You may also virtually raise your hand by clicking the hand icon next to the chat icon if you have a question. A team member will unmute your line so that you may ask your question at the appropriate time. Second, today's call will be recorded to ensure that we capture all questions submitted to the team. A recording of this open call will be available on the Aussie website in the following days. While we're on the topic, please keep in mind that all participants on today's call are muted to reduce background noise as we go throughout the presentation. Finally, complete the interest survey sub to submit additional questions and concerns that you may think of after today's call. Again, I want to say thank you for joining us today, and I'll hand it over to Liz to introduce the rest of the team. Good morning, all. Thanks, Nigel. I'm Elizabeth Leach, the School Nutrition Programs Manager here at OSSI, and here you see an overview of what we're going to talk about today. We'll start with some introductions, discuss the purpose of today's call, and provide updates on new guidance that has been released over the past two weeks. Then we'll hear from Deanna Day from KIPP DC on how KIPP has been providing meals and how they are considering providing meals in the coming school year. We do have a lot of updates and guidance to share today, so we'll pause throughout the hour for some Q&A and leave some time for Q&A at the end before we wrap up as well. In the interest of time, I'll introduce our speakers for today. You've already heard from Nigel and myself. From Aussie, you will also be hearing from Dave Esquith, Health and Wellness's Director of Policy, and Kimberly Thompson, a Program Specialist with the School Nutrition Programs team. As I said earlier, then we'll hear from Deanna Day, the, fruit, the Food Program Manager at KIPP DC. The Aussie Nutrition Programs teams are working to provide timely guidance on how to serve meals when the 2021 school year begins. One way we're doing this is by hosting this series of bi-weekly calls, today being our second in the call series. The purpose of these calls is to provide updates and review new guidance that has been shared, respond to questions that have been submitted through our survey when possible, and provide a platform for peer-to-peer -peer sharing of effective practices. Each call will focus on a specific content area relevant to serving meals when schools reopen. These content areas are tentatively planned moving forward, but are heavily influenced by the input we receive through your survey submissions. Today, we will be focusing on updated health and safety guidance, as well as new guidance released by USDA over the past two weeks that impact meal service options for the school year. And with that, I'll hand it over to Dave Esquith, our Director of Policy. Um, well, thank you, Liz, and good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to kind of cover kind of three, three slides um, and taking a look at the new guidance that um, ASI has put out and the uh, uh, DC Department of Health has put out. Um, that's an update on the guidance that was put out earlier in June. And, but the first thing I want to do is kind of um, do some level setting in terms of making sure that we have all have kind of a public health lens to the uh, uh, to the COVID-19 outbreak. And 
I, I kind of use this example um, uh, that the public health department um, uses and that I think it's helpful for all of us to use as we're um, going about to serve meals in schools. And that lens is simply this, that um, it's important to imagine that one or more persons in a school actually has the virus and that we don't know who that person is. And so as you're thinking about providing meals and as teachers and staff are thinking about instruction, it's important to kind of understand the guidelines and the guidance that's being put out with that in mind, um, that what we are trying to do um, kind of primarily is prevent the spread of the virus. And so if you imagine that someone in the school has the virus, one or more persons in the school has the virus, whether it is a staff person or a student, but you don't know who that is, how would you go about kind of our important tasks of providing meals or providing instruction um, with that knowledge in mind? So it's just kind of an important public health lens to keep in mind as you all kind of go about trying to implement the requirements that are included in the uh, in the guidance. And I'm going to get into kind of that uh, detail in a minute. Um, so where are we in terms of uh, kind of the District of Columbia and COVID-19? Um, you know, I, I think to the credit of everyone in the district, we are trending in the right direction. Um, and we are learning more about kind of the impact of COVID-19 on children and youth uh, every day. But there are a lot of unknowns and those unknowns, it's important to keep in mind that there are a lot of unknowns. At the same time that we are trending in the right direction, the rate of coronavirus deaths per 100,000 persons, um, the district rate sixth highest in the country. So we're trending in the right direction, but we have a very high rate of deaths per 100,000 persons. And the question is, well, why is that? Um, if we're doing all of these things right? And I think the answer is that um, there are simply many people in the district who are at high risk for serious complications if they contract the virus. And our students in our public schools live in those households. Um, and so that is, again, kind of a rationale for the basis for many of these requirements that uh, uh, are provided by DC's Department of Health and, and OSSI. And that a key principle here is that all schools must serve meals following the physical or social distancing and hygiene guidance. That's a must. So let's talk about kind of what that guidance is at a high level, and then we'll talk about what it is kind of we as it applies to meals. Um, so schools must ensure appropriate physical distancing by basic requirement, maintaining a distance of six feet between each individual to the maximum extent feasible, both indoor, in indoor and outdoor settings. For indoor classes or activities, no more than 12 individuals, and this includes staff and students, can be clustered in one room. And this is regardless of the size of the room. It's important to keep that in mind and that one additional staff person, so a total of 13 individuals, can briefly be added to that group if it's necessary, but this is a key and important requirement. Six foot distancing, no more than 12 individuals, staff and students, adding one person briefly, can be together in one room regardless of the size of that room. And for outdoor activities, um, you are allowed to have more than one group of 12 or briefly 13 individuals in kind of a large outdoor space, but those groups must not interact. Um, they can't mix and each group must have kind of meet the, uh, the, the six foot physical distance requirement between them and the next group. So these are kind of basic physical distancing requirements 
that apply to all parts of the school day, including the provision of meals. <clears throat> In terms of specific provision of meals requirements related to physical distancing, hand hygiene, and cleaning. cleaning. Um, number one, to the extent feasible, um, allow students to eat lunch and breakfast in their classrooms rather than mixing in the cafeteria. If this isn't possible, then stagger lunch by class and or divide outdoor eating areas by class, cleaning and sanitizing between groups. And I, I want to emphasize that cleaning and sanitizing between groups provision. Schools must prepackage meals, including silverware, napkins, and seasonings, or serve meals um, uh, individually plated. Students must wash hands before and after eating and may not share utensils, cups, or plates. Staff must wash hands before and after preparing food and after helping children to eat and tables and chairs must be cleaned and sanitized before and after the meal. So those are kind of the basic provision of meals requirements. Um, you've also kind of, I, I've, I've shared with you kind of the larger physical distancing and grouping requirements, and then the lens through which all of this is, uh, uh, is being put together. And happy to answer questions kind of throughout the, uh, uh, as we go through the presentation. So at this point, I'll turn it back over to my colleague, Liz. Thank you, Dave. So now we heard about health and safety guidance from Dave, and now I'm going to transition to providing updates specifically to meal service in the school year. There are a number of flexibilities that USDA has provided allowing meals to be served to students who are both physically in school and those that are distance learning. And throughout today's call, we may reference distance learning as continuous learning or remote learning. Uh, whichever terminology your organization is using, know that they all refer to student, students engaging in learning from home. I have two sections of updates to provide and we will pause for a short Q&A in between each since there is quite a bit of information. As you can see here, school food authorities should plan to utilize the school breakfast program, national school lunch program, after school snack program, and child and adult care food program to serve meals starting on the first day of school for the 2021 school year. In March, when schools unexpectedly transitioned to distance learning due to COVID-19, this was considered an unanticipated school closure. And because it was considered an unanticipated school closure, schools were allowed to operate open feeding sites through the Summer Food Service Program or Seamless Summer Option. As of July 1st, schools can continue serving these meals through SFSP and SSO, these are considered traditional summer meals. The change now is that distance learning due to COVID-19 will no longer be considered an unanticipated school closure and does not allow schools to operate those open feeding sites as soon as the school year begins, so starting the first day of school. And that part's very important. Two other important items to note are that Breakfast, lunch, and snacks served under SBP, NSLP, and ASSP are only reimbursable on school operating days. And meals served through CSEFP are reimbursable both on operating days and non-operating days, provided there is an activity offered. So let's get into that information a little more deeply. On school operating days, which again includes both students learning in person and those distance learning, SFAs can operate the school breakfast program, national school lunch program, after school snack program, and child and adult care food program. These programs are how we traditionally serve students through the school year, and we often see multiple meals being served, breakfast, lunch, and after school snack and or supper provided. 
Please note that operational days is defined by your LEA and includes any day a student is engaged in learning. In a little bit, Deanna is going to share with us how KIPP DC has successfully been serving two meals a day, which has been allowable up till now. So I want to clarify that starting with the school year on your first day of school, operational days um, will mean the days students are engaged in learning and you will be able to serve more than two meals. You can serve breakfast, lunch, after school snack and or supper, assuming you have after school activities aligned with those meals, giving you the ability to serve more than just the two meals a day that have been provided since March. The next two options I'm gonna walk through are less traditional ways of serving meals during the school year, but we wanna share these options and encourage schools to use them if they meet your students' needs. On non-operational school days, and this could include professional development days, breaks during the school year, or weekends, as long as activities are being offered, meals can be served through the Child and Adult Care Food Program. Students can be served up to one meal and one snack on each of these days. The last option is providing meals through the Summer Food Service Program and Seamless Summer Option. Again, many of you have been serving meals through these programs since March. The three ways meals can be served under these programs are during traditional summer months, which USDA considers May through September. That's how meals are being served now. In emergency circumstances, so this might be if there's a hurricane or earthquake. Um, previously, this was how meals were being served during school time. Um, but again, COVID-19 will no longer be considered an unanticipated school closure and meals can't be served via open feeding sites once the school year begins. Lastly, SFSP and SSO can be utilized if schools have longer than 10 or 15 day breaks, which happens more frequently with those operating year round school calendars. So there are some major implications of the constraints and flexibilities allowed for meal service in the coming school year. As I've noted, serving meals via open feeding sites will not be reimbursable starting the first day of school. And we know that many students and families have been relying on these open feeding sites since March for food. Without access to these sites, students will rely on their enrolled school to provide meals. We also know that many more stu students will be learning home from home than ever before. This means that SFAs will need to plan to provide meals to enrolled students, whether they're physically in the school building or in continuous education. In order to be reimbursable, meals will have to follow the appropriate meal pattern and be claimed at the free, reduced and paid statuses or CEP status. We realize these are very large changes and it's a lot of information to take in at once. We encourage you to share this slide deck, which we'll be um, releasing after the call with your teams and engage with your LEA leadership as scheduling and operational decisions are being made. Now more than ever, it's so important that we ensure every DC student is able to receive the meals they need to learn each day and we urge you to explore every option for serving meals on both traditional school days and non-operating days and customize your meal operations to meet your student needs. With that, we will pause for questions on this bit of information. While we take a couple of questions, I'll leave this chart up as a reference. Good morning, this is Kimberly. I'll start reading through the questions in the chat. And I just want to mention too, if we're unable to get to all the questions today, Aussie will continue to incorporate the questions and answers in forthcoming guidance. And our first question deals with packaged meals in the classroom. How should we package meals with silverware and heat the meals? It looks like DC prep is planning to do unitized meals. So there's a concern about the utensils. Sure, um, I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead, Dave. No, you go ahead, Liz. I was going to refer to you to um, to answer this question. 
Sure, not a problem. Um, as Dave said earlier in the health and safety guidance, um, utensils should be silverware, napkins, and seasoning should all be individually packaged. Um, so I'm I'm not sure exactly how you're planning on doing that, but as long what we'd recommend is you don't want um, students to be grabbing all into the same basket to get their to get their utensils. If there's a way to distribute them without them all touching the same utensils, that would be recommended. And there's a follow up question as well. Um, in the classroom, could the food service staff come in and plate everything? And how do food service staff count when we think of the 12 to 1 student to adult ratio? So Did I'll you start want to take the first, yeah. And Dave, take jump it. in. Um, yeah. So as Dave said, um, we need to make sure that there are 12 people, no more than 12 people in a room, a 13th if needed. Um, but food service staff would absolutely count in that 12. Um, so if there is a food service staff member entering a, a classroom to serve meals, that's fine. They need to be counted in that group of 12. And then if schools are serving lunch in the classroom, do chairs and tables need to be sanitized before the students eat at their desk? You know, this is a great question. And um, as I was kind of looking at it, what I was thinking, I mean, this is kind of going back to this idea of the public health lens that if students are in the classroom and they have not come in contact with anything that might be contaminated, whether it be another person or an object which another person may have touched during the course of eating their meal, then there's no reason to kind of clean and sanitize after they've eaten that meal. But if there has been kind of a shared object which has now been introduced to them while they're eating, either because a person has handed them something um, who may have the virus or that that object may have touched another person who had the virus, then it would make sense to clean. So this is where kind of that application of the public health lens in reviewing each situation and determining whether, hey, was there some possibility of contamination here um, is important. If there wasn't, if they're sitting and eating their lunch that they brought after they finished a particular instructional period and nothing really has changed in terms of there being a greater risk for contamination, then there's no need to clean and sanitized after they've eaten their meal, just as there would be no need to clean and sanitize after they've completed their reading instruction. <laughs> but if there has been something introduced during kind of a meal period, then it would be important to clean and sanitize. And then next question deals with extended breaks in school or bridge period, is it up to the LEA to LEA to decide how to operate during extended student breaks? Yes, and I'm going to assume that question um, is in regards to how to operate meal programs during extended student breaks. So yes, as you can see on the screen now, here are all the different options for serving meals. And if there are extended student breaks um longer than 10 or 15 days or shorter than 10 or 15 days there are ways to provide meals during those breaks and we encourage folks to explore those and utilize those and i think why don't we um, move forward with our next round of updates and which after we will continue with q a Okay, so now we will take a look at the five waivers that are currently in place for the coming school year and are all in place through June 30th, 2021. I'll provide a high level overview of what each waiver allows and then discuss how to elect use of each waiver. The first waiver is the non congregate feeding waiver. This allows for consumption of meals off site and outside of group settings, which we know is extremely important in reducing the spread of the virus. This waiver specifically allows for meals to be served via a grab and go model, curbside pickup, mobile or bus routes, or even home delivery. 
The second waiver provides flexibility for meal service times, meaning meals can be provided outside of the traditional breakfast or lunch serving times. Serving times. Because meals don't have to be served within their traditional serving time, multiple meals and even multiple days worth of meals can be provided at the same time. The third waiver allows for parents or guardians to pick up a meal for a student without the student being present. And again, we know this is extremely important to reduce the number of people traveling around the city. The fourth waiver is the meal pattern flexibility waiver. As I mentioned earlier, SFA should plan to meet meal pattern regulations. If an SFA has a targeted and justified reason why they cannot meet the meal pattern while minimizing potential exposure to the virus, they can apply to waive a specific meal pattern requirement on a case by case basis. One thing to note is that previously under SFSP and SSO, a meal pattern waiver could only be approved when there was a supply chain issue due to COVID-19. This new waiver in place through June 30th, 2021 does not require there to be a supply chain issue for the waiver to be approved. Lastly, the high school offer versus serve waiver allows for high school students to be served a five component lunch without being provided the options required under the offer versus serve model. So now that I've introduced the waivers, I know everyone wants to know how to elect use of each of these waivers. Um, and I want to specify while these waivers are in effect, they do require each school food authority to elect use of each of the waivers. Some of the waivers, such as the mealtime waiver or offer versus serve waiver, will be a very simple election, a simple box to check that you plan to elect the waiver. Other waivers, such as those wanting to provide home delivery of meals or those requesting a meal pattern flexibility, will require additional plans or justification before OSI can approve the use of the waiver. We are currently developing a form for SFAs to complete and submit to elect use of each of these waivers. The form is most likely to be an Excel spreadsheet and encompass everything you need in one form. Uh, we anticipate release of this form in July, and when we release it, we'll relay how to complete and submit the form um, for approval. And again, now I'll pause to open up for more questions, and I'll leave the waiver chart open for reference while we discuss. Our first question asks about uh, will delivery and bulk waivers be available for the school breakfast and lunch program? for meals for students that are distance learning? Yes, so under the waivers we just discussed, home delivery will be allowed as long as you're approved and serving meals in bulk, meaning um, if you're serving three days worth of meals at a time, instead of providing three milk cartons, you may be able to provide a milk jug that would be considered something in bulk, will be allow allowable as long as you apply for and are approved for these waivers. Okay. And then if our students are not near our school, how does a school get meals to them? Um, can the school provide multiple meals if they come into school? Great, so I'll answer the second question first and great question. Um, yes, you can provide multiple meals at a time. Again, as long as you elect, um, apply for and approve for these waivers. Um, and actually it's perfect because Deanna Day from KIPP DC is going to share with us one option for how to provide meals that are not to students who are not physically in the building. Um, and we will also dive deeper into that topic on our next bi-weekly call and walk through the multiple options for providing meal to students who are not distance learning, who are distance learning. And then how should a school take meal counts for students that take meals home on days students may be doing distance learning for an AB schedule? Great question. Um, and I'll touch on it now, but please know that our guidance that will be released as well as our further calls and annual training will dive deeper into how to take accountability. Um, similar to how you take accountability under traditional uh, a traditional school year, accountability must be taken for each meal that's served to a student. 
if multiple meals are being served, there must be a tracking me mechanism in place to show um, that you've served, for example, breakfast and lunch for Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, um, so that they've received meals for those days. Why don't we take one more um, and then we will hand it over to Deanna. How should LEAs plan ordering meals for those students at home versus in person or at school? That's a great question and a, a challenge I imagine many folks are going to be facing. And I don't think there's any easy solution or, or magic answer to that. Um, I think we're all entering a little bit of an unknown and a first time providing meals in this environment. <laughs> Um, and I will encourage folks to share with each other what successes they've found in planning for ordering um, and providing meals. Um, and I think that's something we'll continue to explore over the next couple of months. Um, the first thing that comes to mind is I do think the first couple of weeks of this type of meal service um, will be a challenge. And so I encourage people to order enough for the students they think they will eat and a little bit extra. And once a couple of weeks of the school year has gone by to utilize what you've learned in those weeks and apply that to ordering for the future. Okay, and with that, um, I'm gonna introduce Deanna Day, the food program <laughs> manager from KIPP DC. And Deanna is gonna tell us more about how KIPP has found success in providing meals under the summer food service program and, and seamless summer option um, since March. So I'll hand it over to you, Deanna. All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Deanna Day. I'm the food services director for KIPP DC. And today I'm going to talk to you about serving multi-day non-congregate meals. Non-congregate meals are meals that may be taken from a site and consumed elsewhere to allow for social distancing. And this is referred to grab and go meals. We decided to move to a multi-day distribution because these were unprecedented times and there was so much unpredictability. So to support social distancing guidelines, we wanted to decrease opportunities for both public contact, I'm sorry, decrease opportunities for public contact for both our staff and our families. We also recognized that there was a delicate balance between addressing a community need of serving meals and considering the safety and concerns of our staff. We surveyed our families, our staff, and our vendors before starting a multi-day distribution, and we recognized that it was a win-win for all parties uh, based on feedback around pros and cons. So as a precautionary measure, we wanted to minimize staff contact with the public to alleviate staff anxiety around the, during the pandemic around their own health concerns and childcare with the city being shut down. We also recognized that some families may have anxiety about coming out of their homes or bringing their children out. So we wanted to support families by minimizing any disruptions in food accessibility by making their commuting worthwhile. We also wanted to increase program participation and maximize opportunities to claim meals by reducing food waste. We figured families were more likely to leave their homes to pick up three or four day meals versus picking up a single day meal. In response to COVID, OSSI provided the following allowances under SSO and SSFP for unanticipated school closures. They allow schools to serve up to seven days worth of non-congregate meals. They allow schools to serve up to two reimbursable meals per day. Also schools were permitted to serve meals on previously scheduled days off to include weekends and they permitted parent pickup on behalf of children 18 and younger. As Les mentioned, there are new regulations for this coming school year and COVID is no longer considered an unanticipated school closure. So if you wanna serve on both operational and non-traditional operating days, then you have to be mindful if the regulations fall under NSLP, the school breakfast program, the after school snack program or CACFP. 
Now let's take a look at our food operations. So the first thing that we did before moving to a three-day, a multi-day distribution is that we notified our vendor. We communicated with our vendor our interest in serving multi-day meals and any compliance regulations involved. This allows your vendor to adapt to a change in the production as well as ensures that you and your vendor are aligned. This allows your vendor to notify you of their capacity to execute a multi-day approach. As well, you and your vendor agree on the number of meals, packaging, whether you want your meals to come pre-assembled or whether your staff will assemble meals on site at your schools. So for example, one of our vendors had the option to pack out uh, three or four day meals in a box and meals will already come to our school assembled and then staff will only distribute meals. But one of the things that we recognize is if we did receive pre-assembled meals, we would not have the refrigerator capacity to store these meals. So looking at delivery, we had multi-day multi unitized meals, which were delivered at least one day in advance. On, for Monday distribution, meals were delivered on Fridays, and for Wednesday distribution, meals were delivered on Tuesdays. We also decided to simplify the process by scaling back using one vendor. Meals, prep, meals were assembled at least one day in advance as well. So meals were assembled on Fridays and Tuesdays by our FSMC vendor and our staff. We had two serving days, which were on Mondays and Wednesdays between the hours of 10 to 1 p.m. at three locations. Our three serving locations were at our Benning, our Douglas, and our Webb campus. Unitized three-day meals, six meals were served on Mondays, and four-day, which were eight meals, were served on Wednesdays to include weekends. So we served a total of 14 meals for seven days. Breakfast and lunch was served for each day. Families received frozen or cold meals to reheat at home, and they were accompanied with cold storage reheating guides along with meal pattern compliance. Parents and or guardians were also permitted to pick up meals on behalf of their children by identifying how many children were in their household and showing verification. And here is a demo sample of a three-day meal. So it showed families during the distribution what was actually in the bag. Beside that, you'll see a flyer that gives the community that was shared with the community and families which provides information around our distribution times and requirements for parent pickup. So looking at our food operations, our FSMC vendor, as well as KIPP staff distributed meals. Staff had designated roles on distribution day, which included keeping um, point of service. We had bag handlers as well as runners. Food was held in insulated bags while the rest remained in the refrigerator until it was needed. Routine spot checks were conducted by the manager to ensure program compliance. We also implemented social distancing measures and required masks to be worn in the building by all staff. Here's a picture of our web campus where a parent is coming to pick up a meal along with their child through door side pickup. So we limited, um, we limited access to the building by families by providing door side pickup. And as you can see, our food services staff is keeping their distance, handing over their meal to the family, and they're also wearing a mask. Here is an example of our reheating and holding guides. So this is a, one of our vendors, our vendor reheating and holding guides. Um, so again, you want to make sure that you notify your vendor around the compliance and the compliance regulations. So then that way, um, they are aware of the fact that they do have to provide reheating, holding guides, and meal pattern guides. So as you can see here, this is a holding guide, which provides information to families around whether or not meals should be refrigerated, frozen, as well as it provides information about first in, first out. 
Below that is a reheating guide, which provides instructions for families of how to reheat meals based on oven temperature and cooking times for those meals. So when we looked at the advantages and disadvantages of uh, multi-day meal distribution, the pros were it increased morale for staff and allowed them to be more invested in serving the community because staff um, recognized the fact that we heard their concerns through, through the survey um, and we were supporting them while at the same time serving the community. It also allowed staff time for staff to reset on non-traditional, oh, I'm sorry, it allows staff to reset on non-distribution days. It increased participation because it made it worthwhile for families to pick up multiple days of food rather than one day. And we did not lose participants to other sites who were offering multi-day meals. It increased food security for children. It also increased productivity because we were able to serve more meals in less time. It allowed for better waste management because we were able to adequately assess trends rather than having uh, runoff spikes in days here and there. We were able to look at whether Mondays were our high distribution days or Wednesdays were our high distribution days. And we were also able to look at the course of a month to see if the beginning of the month or the end of the month were higher distribution days as well. The only con that we found was that when um, it decreased the number of opportunities for families to come and pick up meals if they missed the serving day. Here you see an example of a flyer that was shared with the community that provided information to those who were walking by and driving by around our distribution days, our pickup times, and the number of meals that were being provided. Now let's take a look at best practices. One of the things you want to do is ensure the accountability and integrity of the program. You also want to keep families at the forefront when placing, when, you also want to keep families at the forefront when planning logistics. So you really want to think about what is best for your families. You want to consider food safety for safe handling, as well as consider the safety of your staff and the families you are serving. So I'm going to touch on the th first three points today and the last point, um, you just want to abide by CDC guidelines, the Department of Health guidelines, and any guidelines shared with OSI. So things to consider when you're looking at accountability and integrity of the program, you want to ensure that you have a procedure to ensure that meals are distributed only to parents and guardians of children 18 and younger, that meals are distributed only to children 18 and younger, that you have a procedure to ensure that duplicate meals are not distributed, and that you have a procedure to manage food waste. Things to consider when keeping families at the forefront. You wanna recognize that families, you wanna be sure that families have the ability to transport meals and understand that some of your families may be on transportation, they may have younger children, or they may have multiple children in the household. So you wanna be sure that the container is durable but yet feasible for families. You want to limit the number of days by providing up to two serving days. You also want to ensure that families have the ability, consider that families have the ability to prepare meals at home and refrigerator capacity for cold holding. So thinking about a family that has three or four children, they could potentially have to hold up to 50 meals in the refrigerator. So that's something to consider as well um, as you're thinking about whether or not you want to have one serving day or multiple serving days. Um, that was one of the factors that drove our decision around having two serving days and providing three-day meals and four-day meals versus providing seven-day meals at a time to families. You also want to identify optional days for families to pick up meals in the event that younger children and children with multiple siblings are unable to transport meals home. You wanna minimize cross-contamination of handling outside items. So you do wanna allow families to bring their own reusable bags. However, you wanna ensure that your staff places food in plastic bags and you allow the families to place bags, the bags in their own reusable bags. Things to consider with food safety and safe handling. 
You want to ensure that you have adequate refrigerator storage to store multiple meals for the volume for the volume of meals needed for students. So for example, this is a, 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 a driving factor of whether or not you want your meals to come pre-assembled in boxes or whether or not your staff will assemble meals at your school. Um, so if meals come pre-assembled, you may not have the refrigerator storage to hold those meals. So that you wanna also consider that as you're deciding how your meals will come from your vendor you also want to make sure that um, whether you also want to consider the combination of shelf stable and refrigerated meals. You want to ensure that you have the necessary equipment to properly hold meals during distribution. So whether or not um, you may need to purchase insulated bags, that's also something you want to consider as you move to that multi day distribution. Now, let's look forward to school reopening. We serve pre-K through high school students. So while we have a draft of plans for this coming school year, this information is constantly being adapted based on survey feedback, discussion during, discussions during task force meetings, as well as new regulations that come out. We plan to serve, we plan for classroom service for most meals with grab and go breakfast for older children, recognizing the fact that older children are least likely to participate in breakfast. Also, we are considering staggered arrival times. Um, so this will allow social distancing at the grab and go carts. While at the same time, we also are considering in the event that we do see students congregating around grab and go carts, then we would also have the option to move breakfast back into the classroom. We are considering providing students with box or bag meals equipped with all items such as unitized food, condiments, napkins, and utensils. And so we are so excited, as um, Liz had mentioned, that the high school students this year, there is a flexibility around the offer versus serve. And so with that being said, it allows us to provide all items in the box or bag and serve them to high school students to eliminate the possibility of others handling their food. We also wanted to simplify, we're also looking at simplifying the process by scaling back on the number of daily options available to students. We have a FSMC contract versus a, con a Bendit contract so this gives us accessibility to more staff to support with execution. So we are planning um, to serve multi-day meals for remote learning days. And we are looking at one, either distributing those meals in the classroom at the end of the school day. So where students will receive bag meals from their teacher at the end of the school day and food service staff or the teacher would then conduct point of, services, point of service as those bags are distributed to students. We also are permitting students to parents to, for, we, are, we also are permitting parents to have curbside pickup or doorside pickup at the last in-school session day when they pick up their students. We are considering scheduled distribution days on our non-school session days with the possibility of two pickup windows to accommodate families. We're exploring home delivery for 100% remote learners as well. So one of the biggest things I would say as you plan and think about school reopening and how you're gonna serve meals to families, and I can't say this enough that you wanna survey, survey, survey. You wanna make sure that you're surveying your parents and all stakeholders involved around school reopening operations and adjusting your plans accordingly. Thank you so much for your time. And I am now going to turn it back over to Kimberly. Hi, Deanna. It looks like there's a few questions about your model of service. Um, how did you take meal counts and how did you ensure that it was only your families? So during the summer, um, we operated under SSFP. And so we operated as an open site. So we provided meals to our families as well as to the community at large. And so every time that a, a bag meal was taken, we then counted that um, 
we then marked off how many uh, bags were taken for children. And then we utilized a spreadsheet. So rather than having three or four days to mark it off, we just had one point of service form. We marked off as each parent took a meal for a student, and then we put that information into a spreadsheet. And then that information was then copied over for the number of days that we served. So for example, if on that given day, we have 50 meals that were picked up on that Monday, and we knew that we served meals for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, then though that 50 was then uh, transferred over as meals for 50 on Monday, 50 on Tuesday, and 50 on Wednesday. And then there's a question earlier in the chat uh, that asked if a school is only operating two days a week where the students come in and then the th other three days they're distance learning. Does the SFA is the, is the SFA required to provide meals in distance learning? Great question. Thanks for asking that. Um, I think, you know, the important thing I'm thinking about is that our students have relied so much on these meals in schools um, and they'll continue to do so. And so we want to make sure we're making meals as accessible as possible for students. So meals must be available for students. Um, as we discussed through the waivers, home delivery and things like that are allowed. Those, those models may be right for some folks, but are not required by any means, but making sure that students have access, know how to get meals and can get meals is a part of being a school food authority. And then if a school goes on a long break and wants to utilize the seamless summer option again, do they have to submit a new application for school year 21? Yep, great question. So yes, the an short answer is yes. Long answer is that um, the seamless summer option application is a part of the larger national school lunch program application. So you'll be able to apply as a part of your NSLP application. And there's a few questions about taking meal counts um, for non CEP schools to take accurate meal counts for families. How do we continue to offer meals to families not enrolled in our school? So great question, and there is a great distinction there between how meals have been served since March and are being served right now and what's allowable starting the first day of school. Um, so Deanna shared some great um, best practices of how KIPP DC is offering meals now and has been since March. Again, now open feeding sites have allowed schools to offer meals to any student 18 and under. Moving forward for the first day of school, um, school food authorities are allowed to provide meals to enrolled students, so not any student um, 18 and under. Um, so the question was regarding accountability, but I wanted to make that clarification. Um, and then I'm hearing a lot of questions about accountability actually. So I think this is a great flag that we will make sure to dive in deeper in future guidance. Um, but I think the example Deanna gave is a great way to take accountability. Um, you're able to take it for multiple days at a time if you're offering multiple days worth of meals at a time. Um, you know, similar to how you take it in a traditional school year um, where in a non CEP school, you have students names, you would be checking off that they received a meal. And then this question can be applied to Deanna and what Kip did this past summer. Um, did you find it challenging to provide seven days worth of meals for families as far as uh, them carrying home a lot of food at one time or um, twice during the week? So I would say that so we didn't provide seven day meals for that reason. Um, and we limit we limited it to uh, three and four day meals. And we didn't have any families that had any challenges because most families were probably picking up maybe two or three bags um, with, you know, some picking up more, but the majority were picking up two and three day bags. 
And then should schools apply for the seamless summer program if we're at risk, um, if being risk averse and anticipating that schools may close again due to positive cases? Great question. So um, again, there's there's two kind of questions in there. Um, one, should folks apply for the seamless summer option if they're risk averse? Um, I don't see any harm in applying for it, except for a little bit of extra uh, paperwork that you might have to fill out, even if you might not utilize it. But let me clarify that um, if a school is engaging in both students being present and distance learning, and then at some point transitions to all distance learning because there are positive cases. Um, meals will continue to be served through the school breakfast program and national school lunch program and cannot be served via SSO through those open feeding sites. So the example you gave is actually not a reason to apply for SSO, um, but folks could apply for it um, and have those applications approved if they wanted to use one of the other allowable methods. And with that being being sensitive to time, I know there are many questions remaining in the chat that we didn't get to. Um, as Kimberly said before, we will continue to make sure we answer these questions in the guidance that we're releasing, as well as the upcoming biweekly calls and NSLP annual training that is scheduled for late July. Um, before we head out, I did want to share what you can expect to come. As Dave discussed earlier, the health and safety guidance and an FAQ around the health and safety guidance were re-released this week. And you can anticipate a July release of the meal service guidance, um, including a lot of the information we discussed today. Um, also, we continue to have a survey open, so please continue to submit questions, concerns, any requests for topics that you want us to dive into on these calls in that survey. We will keep it open. Um, our next bi-weekly call is scheduled for July 23rd at the same time at 10 a.m. And the focus of that call will be serving meals to students who are distance learning. Um, so we will have some more examples of how to do that there. And as a reminder, information will continue to be emailed out when high priority will be released via our Beyond the Train newsletter, continues to be available on the OSSI website, and our annual NSLP training at the end of the month will focus specifically on the nuances of serving meals for this coming school year. As well, please continue to reach out to any of our team members for technical assistance as you're developing your meal service plan. We wanted to share a number of resources that USDA has provided. Um, while these are specific to the summer food service program and seamless summer option, there are um, some tools and tips in there that are very helpful and translate well to the school year. So these are great resources um, that will be shared out in our newsletter as well. And lastly, if you're interested in operating the child and adult care food program and don't currently have a specialist, you can reach out to Katrina Florek or Monica Clark and they will make sure that you have a specialist to work with. I'll put their contact information in the chat box now for you. Um, and again, feel free to reach out to any of our team members for questions and technical assistance. Thank you for engaging with us today, and we look forward to seeing you again.